to Sabbath Streams Ministries Worship and Word Service on March 2nd, 2019. This morning we will be talking about the regulations of Sabbath and the tabernacle.
God choose life. song for us to do and entering in the presence of God we delight in his day.
songs they go so fast and like this week we had a skunk underneath the building and so there's a little bit of a skunk smell still there but I am um, allergic to musk oil and so when there's a skunk around I have a little bit harder of a time getting my breath and holding my breath because it affects my lungs so that's yeah I added an extra measure of just just to get a breath <laughs> Let's go ahead and stand and begin with the, the, the shofar calling us into worship and the Shema and the lighting of the candles and go from there. And Joy um, it has, I, I like the way Joy does the Shema, don't you? Yeah. Yes. You guys enjoy that. It is different than what we did before, but you know what? It's beautiful. Yes. And there's great beauty in recognizing all the different ways this is done. So Joy, would you come and lead us in the Shema? <laughs> and for the shofar, the blessing. Berukata Aronai Alachenu Malacha Alom. Asher Kirishanu Bimitzpetav Vitzivanu Lishmoa Chol Shofar. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the Universe, who sanctifies us with your commandments and has instructed us to hear the sound, the voice of the shofar. <laughs> Thank you. 
that I command you today shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall speak of them when you sit at home, and when you walk along the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be for frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house, and upon your gates, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. together we receive a light from you that we might shine it forth that the nations may see and glorify you Lord God because you are a good God you are a great God and you are worthy of it all oh that we would weep between the porch and the altar that we would fall upon I believe I have a word for the people and, and, and she just read that for us. That there is a place that we are called as intercessors. We are called to stand between the porch and the altar. If what we do here on a regular basis just makes us feel good, then we're wasting our time. It is to be for God's glory. It is to be for the people, it is to be a ministry that brings in others because we are obedient. Let's do walk in the light. Oh. Huh? Yeah. Come house of Jacob, walk in the light. Let me try. <laughs> <laughs> Ready? Come house of Jacob, let us walk in
on our YouTube, on our um, Facebook page, so they end up on our on our webpage. I take them from the online resource of First Fruits of Zion. Okay, the online resource. What I forget to do sometimes is to check the printed version. So this week we actually have a different gospel portion than what is in the printed version. And we're gonna stick with the online source for that. But because there's also a different Hofstra portion and yet it fits with what today is, we're gonna go ahead and do both Hofstras, the one that's online and the one that's listed here. And that's what's listed on this that you guys signed up for, okay? Usually I go with the online version, usually it's the same, but this time, it got me. <laughs> and I didn't realize it till last night, and I already had stuff getting ready for today. And I was like, nah, I'm not changing that. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, at least it's a Hoftra. Today's reading um, by Echel is in non leap years, read together with, with the next one. So there's there's usually it's a combination. This year it's separated because we have a leap year. We have an extra month of Adar. So we have um, today today's reading. Um, Chris is going to come. We're beginning in Exodus chapter 35, verses 1 through 29. And I'm going to call you up in the order as they appear in Scripture, not as the order they were on this paper. So it will be Chris and then Helene and then Joy. Exodus 35, 1 through 29. Then Moses assembled all the congregation of the sons of Israel and said to them, These are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a holy day, a Sabbath of complete rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. Moses spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded, saying, Take from among you a contribution to the Lord, whoever is of a willing heart. Let him bring it as the Lord's contribution, gold, silver, and bronze, and blue, purple, and scarlet material, fine linen, goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red, and porpoise skins, and acacia wood, and oil for lighting, and spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones, and setting stones for the ephod, and for the breastpiece. <coughs> Let
let every skillful man among you come and make all that the Lord has commanded, the tabernacle, its tent, and its covering, its hooks and its boards, its bars, its pillars, and its sockets, the ark and its poles, the mercy seat and the curtain of the screen, the tabernacle and its poles and all its utensils, and the bread of the presence, the lampstand also for the light, and its utensils and its lamps, and the oil for the light, and the altar of incense, and its poles, and the anointing oil, and the fragrant incense, and the screen for the doorway at the entrance of the tabernacle. The altar of burnt offering with its bronze grating, its poles, and all its utensils, the basin and its stand, the hangings of the court, its pillars and its sockets, and the screen for the gate of the court, the pegs of the tabernacle and the pegs of the court and the cords, the woven garments for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron, the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister as priests. Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel departed from Moses' presence. Everyone whose heart stirred in him and everyone whose spirit moved him came and brought the Lord's contribution for the work of the tent of meeting and for all its service and for the holy garments. Then all whose hearts moved them, both men and women, came and brought brooches and earrings and signet rings and bracelets, all articles of gold. So did every man who presented an offering of gold to the Lord. Every man who had in his possession blue and purple and scarlet material and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and porpoise skins brought them. Everyone who could make a contribution of silver and bronze brought the, the Lord's contribution. And every man who had in his possession acacia wood for any work of the service brought it. All the skilled women spun with their hands and brought what they had spun in blue and purple and scarlet material, and in fine linen. All the women whose hearts stirred with a skill spun the goat's hair. The rulers brought the onyx stones and the stones for setting for the ephod and for the breastpiece, and the spice and the oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. The Israelites, all the men and women whose heart moved them to bring material for all the work which the Lord had commanded through Moses to be done, brought a free will offering to the Lord. Helene is going to come and read Exodus 35, verse 30 through 36, verse 7. Then Moses said to the sons of Israel, See, the Lord has called my name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled with and he has filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all craftsmanship to make designs for working in gold and in silver and in bronze and in the cutting of stones for sitting and in the carving of wood so as to perform in every inventive work. He also has put in his heart to teach both he and Oholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, he has filled them with skill to perform every work of an engraver and of a designer and of an embroiderer in blue and in purple and in scarlet material and in fine linen and of a weaver as performers of every work and markers of designs. Of designs. Continue. Now be Zalel and Oholia and every skillful person in whom the Lord has put skill and understanding to know how to perform all the work in the construction of the sanctuary shall perform in accordance with all that the Lord has commanded. Then Moses called Bezalel and Oholia and every skillful person in whom the Lord had put skill, everyone whose heart stirred him to come to, do, to work 
to come to the work to perform it. They received from Moses all the contribution which the sons of Israel had brought to perform the work in the construction of the sanctuary. And they still continued bringing to him free will offerings every morning. And all the skillful men who were performing all the work of the sanctuary came, each from the work which he was performed, which he was performing. And they said to Moses, the people are bringing much more than enough for the construction work which the Lord commanded us to perform. So Moses issued a command and a proclamation was circulated throughout the camp saying, let no man or woman any longer perform work for the contributions of the sanctuary. Thus the people were restrained from bringing any more. For the material they had was sufficient and more than enough for all the work to perform it. Exodus 38 verses one through 20 completes the Torah portion. Joy is going to read that for us today. Then he made an altar of burnt offering of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits wide, square, and three cubits high. He made its horns on four corners its horns being of one piece with it, and he overlaid it with bronze. He made all the utensils of the altar, the pails and the shovels and the basins, the flush hooks and the fire pan. He made all its utensils of bronze. He made for the altar a grating, grating of bronze network beneath under its ledge, reaching halfway up. He cast four rings on the four ends of the bronze grating as holders for the poles. He made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with bronze. He inserted the poles into the rings on the sides of the altar with which to carry it. He made it hollow with planks. Moreover, he made the labor of bronze with its base of bronze with the mirrors of the serving women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Then he made the court. For the south side, the hangings of the court were of fine twisted linen, 100 cubits. Their 20 pillars and their 20 sockets made of bronze, and the hooks of the pillars and their bands were of silver. For the north side, there were 100 cubits, their 20 pillars and their 20 sockets were of bronze. The hooks of the pillars and their bands were of silver. For the west side, there were hangings of 50 cubits with their 10 pillars and their 10 sockets. The hooks of the pillars and their bands were of silver. For the east side, 50 cubits. The hangings for the one side of the gate were 15 cubits and their three pillars and their three sockets, and so for the other side. On both sides of the gate of the court were hangings of 15 cubits with their three pillars and their three sockets. All the hangings of the court all around were of fine twisted linen. The sockets for the pillars were of bronze, the hooks of the pillars and their bands of silver, and the overlaying of their tops of silver, and all the pillars of the court were furnished with silver bands. The screen of the gate of the court was the work of the weaver of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. And the length was 20 cubits and the height was five cubits according to the hangings of the court. Their four pillars and their sockets were of bronze. Their hooks were of silver, and the overlay of their tops and their bands were of silver. And all the pegs of the tabernacle and of the court all around were of bronze.
Out of 1 Kings, chapter 7, verses 40 through 51, which is the reading that I had used, um, Bob is going to come and read that for us today for the Haftarah. 1 Kings 4, 7, <coughs> verses 40 through 51. Now Hiram made the basins and the shovels and the bowls. So Hiram finished doing all the work which he performed for King Solomon in the house of the Lord. The two pillars and the two bowls of the capitals which were on top of the two pillars and the two uh, networks to cover the two bowls of the capitals which were on the top of the pillars and the 400 pomegranates for the two networks two rows of pomegranates for each network the cover of the two bowls of the capitals which were on the top of the pillars and the tin uh, stands with the tin basins on the stands and the one sea and the 12 oxen under the sea and the uh, pails and the shovels and the bowls even all these utensils which Hiram made for, the, for King Solomon in the house of the Lord were polished bronze. In the plain of the Jordan, the king cast them. On the clay ground between Sukkoth and Zarethan, Solomon left all the utensils unweighed because they were were too many uh, the weight of the bronze could not be uh, ascertained uh, at, uh, Solomon made all the furniture which uh, was in the house of the Lord the golden altar the golden table on which the bread of the presence and the lampstands, uh, five on the right five, and five on the left in front of the inner sanctuary of pure gold, and the flowers and the lamps and the tongs of gold, and the cups and the snuffers, and the bowls and the spoons and the fire pans of pure gold and the hinges both for, for the door of the inner house the most holy place and for the door on the house that is of the nave of gold uh, is that all of it one more verse. One more. Yeah. Thus all the work of that King Solomon performed in the house of the Lord was finished, and Solomon brought in the things dedicated by his father David, the silver and the gold and the <coughs> utensils, and he put them in the treasuries of the house of the Lord. Thank you. Janie's going to come and read the portion that was listed in the in our little guide. It's out of Second Kings, and um, if you have a standard Bible, it's Second Kings eleven, beginning with verse twenty-one to verse chapter twelve, verse sixteen. If you have a, a complete Jewish Bible or that kind of translation, it's, it's Second Kings. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 17. So it's 11, the last verse of 11 and the first 
16 verses of chapter 12 for most of you. Jehoash was seven years old when he became king. In the seventh year of Jehu, Jehoash became king, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Zibiah of Beersheba. Jehoash did right in the sight of the Lord all his days in which Jeho Jehoiada, the priest, instructed him. Only the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. Then Jehoash said to the priests, All the money of the sacred things, which is brought into the house of the Lord, in current money, both the money of each man's assessment, and all the money which any man's heart prompts him to bring into the house of the Lord, let the priests take it for themselves, each from his acquaintance, and they shall repair the damages of the house wherever any damage may be found. But it came about that in the 23rd year of King Jehoash, the priests had not repaired the damages of the house. Then the king called for Jehoiada, the priest, and for the other priests, and said to them, Why do you not repair the damages of the house? Now therefore take no more money from your acquaintances, but pay it for the damages of the house. So the priests agreed that they would take no more money from the people, nor repair the damages of the house. But Jehoiada, the priest, took a chest and bored a hole in its lid and put it beside the altar on the right side as one comes into the house of the Lord. And the priest who guarded the threshold put, it, put in it all the money which was brought into the house of the Lord. When they saw that there was much money in the chest, the king's scribe and the high priest came up and tied it in bags and counted the money which was found in the house of the Lord. They gave the money which was weighed out into the hands of those who did the work, who had the oversight of the house of the Lord, and they paid it out to the carpenters and the builders who worked on the house of the Lord, and to the masons and the stone cutters, and for buying timber and hewn stone to repair the damages to the house of the Lord, and for all that was laid out for the house to repair it. But there were not made for the house of the Lord silver cups, snuffers, bowls, trumpets, any vessels of gold or vessels of silver from the money which was brought into the house of the Lord. For they gave that to those who did the work, and with it they repaired the house of the Lord. Moreover, they did not require an accounting from the men into whose hand they gave the money to pay to those who did the work, for they dealt faithfully. The money from the guilt offerings and the money from the sin offerings was not brought into the house of the Lord. It was for the priests. The gospel portion that was posted online and that we're going to be using today is out of Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. And Craig is going to come and read that for us. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples became hungry and began to pick the heads of grain and eat. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on a Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he became hungry, he and his companions, how he entered the house of God? <clears throat> Excuse me. How he entered the house of God and they ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those with him, but for the priests alone? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? But I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not a sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Departing from there, he went into their synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered, and they questioned Jesus, asking, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. And he said, 
What man is there among you who has a sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will he not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? So then it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and it was restored to normal like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. <clears throat> Blessed are you. We talk about the Sabbath day today, the holy days that God has set apart. Blessed are you, O Lord our God. Turn in his holy king. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
humble we need to ask him to teach us his ways to show us his face and, and that we seek it um, this morning I wasn't quite sure I was going to start all this and then a person that I am friends with online who leads a congregation um, here in Oregon in fact we have his CD that he put together the Sabbath songs and stuff Mark Stanart and he put this on Facebook this morning. It's just a perfect, perfect way to begin this teaching. It says, what the Bible doesn't tell us is often just as important as what it does tell us. There are a lot of things that are unclear in the Bible. Was it badger skins or porpoise skins that covered the tabernacle? Various translations, even Jewish ones, are going to disagree on that and on the actual stones that were on the priest's breastplate. And what the heck is this Urim and Thummim? <laughs> Love the way he says that. The questions don't end there with the Hebrew texts. We, I mean, there's more questions. Is tithing a thing, a standard for giving? On what day did the biblical festivals fall? Is divorce a sin? Of course, there are plenty of people out there, and this is what he wrote, who don't have any problem answering any of these questions. And they are convinced that the conclusions they've arrived at are correct. But there are also plenty of people who will adamantly disagree with those positions and have equal evidence to support their conclusions. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this, hidden things belong to God, our Lord. But that which has been revealed applies to us and to our children forever. Therefore, we must keep all the words of this Torah. As a, he says, I love this verse and hate it at the same time. It clearly says there's stuff we don't understand that doesn't make sense to us. Don't worry about it. That belongs to God. If you don't understand it, don't worry about it. That's God's problem. Okay. But there are things we do understand. And it says that there's a way to understand some things too. 
You know, the hidden things belong to God. And there is a verse in Psalms that says it is the privilege of a king to search out the hidden things. And if we are kings and priests before God, it's our privilege to search. But honestly, there's some things we're going to not agree on, right? The scripture is like a treasure box full of keys. Some of the keys, there are keys that open in the box. Some things are just flat there. They're right there. Some are, it's like a big box with little boxes, you know. And some of the keys are locked in other boxes, and some of the keys are kept back by the Spirit of the Lord. Our job is to honor, to guard the entire box, to open what we are able to open, and apply it to our lives, and to continue to seek a deeper understanding, matching keys with the locked boxes as we move forward. I was discussing with a friend of ours this week some of the 613 commandments. And she had found a list online of the 613 commandments, and she was really pleased because God had showed, reminded her of that number, and it's not a number she would think of normally. So she looked it up, and she found it, and she's reading the list, and she found a couple in there she didn't like very much. And I said, so which one show me? Well, it says here a man can rape his wife and still be married to her. That's not good. I said, ah, that's not what it's saying. Let me give you a different, different perspective on that. What that's saying is a man who abuses his wife does not have an excuse to divorce her. It's not an excuse. In the day in which Torah was given, for a woman to be divorced meant she had no support. She had no finances. She had no place to live. She had no way to take care of herself or her children. So what God was saying is, just because you're mad at your wife, just because you don't like her, doesn't mean you can take it out on her and then divorce her. You can't do that. You are to be married to her, you are to provide for her, and you are to take care of her. She's your wife. She went, oh, that's a really different perspective. I said, yes, it is. And here's the thing. When we look at anything in the scripture, there's over a thousand commandments in the New Testament. <clears throat> over a thousand instructions, which is another word for commandment, right? Paul gave lots of them. You who are a thief, don't be a thief anymore. If you lived this way, don't do it anymore. Don't do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. There's over a thousand commandments in the New Testament. So don't tell me God didn't give us commandments as believers. Those thousands, over a thousand, all are taken out of the 613 that you can find. And, and I know 613 actually is kind of an arbitrary number. It's a number that is, it's a rabbinical understanding where they put them into certain categories. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But there's nothing wrong with saying there's 613 commandments. There's probably a few more if you divide them up or separate them out a little differently. You can do that if you want to. That's your problem. <laughs> I'm not going to try to study through all that and figure that out. Out of those 613, each one of those comes out of the Big Ten, right? The Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments hinge on two pillars. Love the Lord. Love your neighbor. These are the pillars. I will say these are the keys to unlock the rest of Scripture. These are the keys we use to understand the commandments of God. Does this apply to how I love God? Does this apply to how I love my neighbor? If the way I'm understanding this commandment takes me away from either of those things, then I'm not understanding the commandment right. Because God says, love me, love the Lord, serve him, don't serve other gods, is part of loving God, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, love does not mean I approve of everything somebody does. That's not love. Love sometimes sets limits and boundaries. And we're going to talk about those boundaries today. Some of those boundaries that God set for his people. For us. The very beginning of our reading, the first three verses, Exodus 35, 1 through 3, 
When Moses assembled all the congregation of Bene Israel and said to them, These are the words which Adonai has commanded you to do. Work is to be done for six days, but the seventh day is a holy day for you, a Shabbat of complete rest to Adonai. Whoever does any work on that day will die. Do not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on Yom Shabbat or the day of Sabbath. Father, I'm asking right now that you would help me as I explain what I've studied and what I've learned and, and as I try to present this in a way that, that is honoring to you, Lord. Father, that is something that we can begin to understand and apply to our lives differently. Father, that today we will understand something more than we have. And Father, that we will hear clearly from you how it applies to each one of us individually. In the name of Yeshua. There's some things I'm going to say today you might not agree with. That's okay. You might find scriptures that show a different perspective. You might see it differently. That's okay. This is the way the Lord has kind of been showing it to me in the last few months and weeks. And, and I was supposed to talk about it last week and didn't. Um, so he said, no, you get another chance. Here you go. He's good at that. What does it mean to rest on the Sabbath? What does it mean? And does that apply to us today? I mean, I'm not Jewish, are you? <laughs> I mean, we, yeah, okay. So there's actually a contingency, there's actually a group that teach that the laws of Sabbath, Sabbath in these particular laws were given as a sign to the Jews, and they are required to keep it, but Gentiles aren't. They actually teach that. And um, I'm going to quote from some of the stuff, other stuff that this particular group is teaching because I really like most of what they teach, but I'm not sure that they've got this accurate. It's this whole concept of separate but equal. And I think we had a, a um, Supreme Court decision about that a few years back that separate and equal cannot be. It doesn't work. You can't make blacks go to this school and whites go to this school and consider that you're going to be giving them equal treatment. It doesn't happen. Our Supreme Court ruled against that. So to me, I'm like, when I start reading about separate but equal, I, I, I always go back to that in mind. Well, if we, if we insist on separate, how do we, are, how do we understand equal? Preach it, sister. Huh? Preach it, sister. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have my hearing aid on today because I found when I sing with my hearing aid and I give myself feedback. <laughs> I haven't got it's there's something with the setting that needs to be adjusted. And uh, when you're in the middle of singing and all of a sudden you have this, it, it hurts. But anyway, um, but Sabbath is important and it's important to us and it's important to followers of Jesus. There are those who will say that Jesus said you could violate the Sabbath. You didn't have to keep the Sabbath, right? You're going to hear that in churches all over the place. Sabbath's done away with. It's part of the Old Covenant. If Jesus taught his disciples that it was okay to violate the Sabbath, then in Luke chapter 23, and I'm going to read it to you, Luke chapter 23, verses 54 to 56, this is the time of Yeshua's death, okay? It says he died, the man went to Pilate, asked for Yeshua's body, he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb cut out of a rock where no one had yet ever been laid. That's verses 52 and 53. Verse 54. Now it was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was approaching. So it's Friday afternoon. Or it's the day before Pesach which is also a Sabbath. So that could be a different day of the week, and we're talking about honoring Pesach as a Sabbath day. Okay, we know he was resurrected on the first day of the week, and, and the, all those details we'll talk about more at Passover time, okay? That's in a couple weeks. It was the day of preparation. Sabbath was approaching. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed. They saw the tomb, and they saw how the body was laid. Then they returned 
and prepared spices and perfumes. So they got ready. But on the Sabbath they rested according to the commandments. If Yeshua had taught them it was okay to violate the Sabbath for just whatever they wanted to, wouldn't the anointing of the body for burial be one of those things they could violate the Sabbath for? Apparently it's not. I know in modern Judaism today, um, a burial must take place within a certain number of days, within three days I think it is, and there is a preparation of the body, there's a washing of the body. I have We have a friend that we know who's a dance person in, in, the, in the Messianic movement, who has gone and has studied this and is now going around and teaching in Messianic congregations the traditional way to handle a body when the spirit has departed so that we honor it. Traditional Judaism has an honoring. They baptize the dead. Guys, they wash the bodies in honor for the person and they pray for that person as they do. That's what baptizing the dead is. Because they believe there's a resurrection and so they prepare the body for the resurrection in part by baptizing, by washing the body, okay? That's an answer to some other question in another place. But anyway, side note, right? If they were taught it was okay to violate the Sabbath for whatever, why did the women wait? They delayed the task even of anointing his body. They rested as the commandment because the Sabbath day is a day where there is no work to be done. You don't work. The word that's translated work in our Bibles is melacha, melacha, which basically means creative production. There is no direct translation of melacha. It doesn't translate in exactness. Okay. It really, it means a creative production. It's translated this way in many places as work, business, labor, to create one's occupation or to produce. That's malcha. We don't participate in creative production on the Sabbath, according to the commandment. And, but, but, what specifically is work, right? What is a creative work? What is a production? Now, there's some things that we can know automatically are creative works. We can know automatically some things, but there's a lot that's not specific in Scripture. So I decided I'd look at what is specific, okay? Exodus 16, 20, and I'm just going to give you a list with some verses. I'm not going to go to all of these. So you can look them up later. Exodus 16, 23 tells us we're not supposed to cook supposed to cook the day before or in preparation but we're not supposed to cook on the Sabbath Exodus 35 verse 3 says we don't create a fire or we don't kindle a fire so you don't begin the fire on that day now it has been ruled and and rightfully so I think that if you're in a location where it's freezing and your fire goes out kindle a new one don't let yourself die <laughs> okay I will say that don't let yourself die if the fire goes out. If the heater, if the if the um, if the heater's light goes out, relight it if you have to. Okay, because the Sabbath does say don't kindle a fire. But there's hedges around that. Does that show love to the Lord? Does that show love to my neighbor to let myself die because I'm cold? Remember, everything hinges on those two. Everything. Exodus 16, 29 through 30, and Numbers 15, 32, both show us that we are not to be gathering food or wood. You can't gather the manna, and the man wasn't allowed to go gather wood, right? Those are direct, specific things the scripture shows us. Don't do this on Sabbath, right? Basically, no harvesting. Don't harvest whether it's wood, whether it's food, whatever it is, we don't harvest. Exodus 34, 21 specifies that we don't plow or harvest. In the promised land, he says, when you get to the promised land, I don't want you plow, I don't care what the season is, you don't plow and you don't harvest on the Sabbath. 
get it done before or do it after. Now that might apply actually quite heavily in an agricultural zone. It's not as applicable to us in some aspects, but we can think about it. It's no preparation of the soil, no getting ready to work. You don't prepare for work on the Sabbath. You don't reap the rewards of your work on the Sabbath either. That's the harvesting. Jeremiah 17, 21 and 22 talks about carrying loads in and out of the city or away and in and out of your house. We're not to carry loads. That, by the way, is one of the reasons that, mo that in Jewish congregations, they don't blow a shofar on the Sabbath. It has nothing to do with blowing the instruments wrong or playing the instrument is necessarily wrong, although there's a lot of places where there's no instrumentation on the Sabbath in a synagogue. It's before or after, but not on Sabbath. But the concern is you might carry your shofar from your house to the synagogue. And we're not supposed to carry a load. And I think that's, you know, it's supposed to be a day of rest. Now, where do they get all the other stuff? Well, I'm going to come right out of the highest sods book on the Sabbath. We have not done this series yet. There's a reason we haven't done this series. And I would like to go through it with some people. But, again, there is some teaching in it that I look at and went separate but equal. How does that work? Who is a Jew and who isn't a Jew? We are all sons of Abraham. Okay. So to me, that kind of threw me off. <laughs> it's not what I'm used to seeing. But they do give us some really good instructions as to what is done on a Sabbath and what is not done on a Sabbath. What's rabbinically allowed and what's not rabbinically allowed. Um, what is required. And they talk about the 39 prohibitions. Okay. The, the way, the place that comes from, the way the 39 prohibitions, the way those things come, it, these are not the ones that were specified here. These are the things that it took to, to build the tabernacle. And why do we say that? Because it says here in the instructions about building the tabernacle, twice now he inserts a passage about resting on Sabbath. Even the work of building the tabernacle was not to take place on the Sabbath. As important as the tabernacle is, as important as Yeshua's body was to anoint and prepare for burial, we don't do that on the Sabbath. And there's 39 prohibitions, and I, will, I was going to copy this out for you, but I don't think it's necessary. I'm just going to read the list. These are all things that are found that they did to build the tabernacle, that they are saying that the rabbis have said, we don't do these things on the Sabbath because God said not to work on the tabernacle on the Sabbath, okay? Planting, plowing, harvesting, threshing, winnowing, selecting, grinding, sifting, kneading, cooking as in boiling, baking, or melting. <coughs> Shearing, washing, combing, dyeing, spinning, chain stitching, wrapping, weaving, unraveling, knotting, untying, tying, sewing, tearing, trapping, slaughtering, skinning, tanning, marking, smoothing or polishing, shaping, writing, erasing, Building, demolishing, extinguishing, burning, completing, carrying, which includes the buying and the selling of goods. In a really strict traditional home, you will discuss the scriptures on the Shabbat, but you won't be taking notes because you can't write on the Sabbath. That's from the 39 prohibitions. That's rabbinical. I don't believe that's all applicable honestly I think some of that is a bit of a stretch or a push but, but these are all things that it took in order to build the tabernacle they fall into four different categories one of the general categories is the making of bread or food one is the making of the fabric anything that comes about to make a fabric 
anything you have to do to do that. Leather production, anything you have to do to produce something that's made of leather. And then it says number four, miscellaneous, and kind of that's all this other stuff. Okay. And those are the prohibitions of Sabbath rabbinically based on the building of the tabernacle. If anyone wants to, to look at this, I can show it to you later. This is the leader's guide. They put all the right, they, they wrote all the answers in it. <laughs> um, that's a lot of stuff to stop doing, right? That's a lot of stuff to remember, too. And to me, I'm like, I don't know about that. And yet, one, two, three, where's page four? <laughs> where's page four? I worked on this, guys. <laughs> so that's easy. It's okay. We are going to go to see what is about what what is involved in the Sabbath. To the scriptures. Isaiah fifty-eight. Isaiah 58. Hmm. I wonder where that page is. Okay. Well, we'll just go from the scripture then. Isaiah chapter 58, and, and, and the reason I'm looking for it is because I had some translation stuff written on it. I thought it was one of those reads that I wanted to Huh? Okay, let's read Isaiah chapter 58, verses 13 and 14. We'll actually start with verse 12. Isaiah chapter 58, 12, 13, and 14. shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt, is that right? Yeah. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, when thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from giving thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So a lot of people want to be called the repairers of the breach, right? Yeah. I've heard that from a lot of different people over the years. But part of repairing the breach, part of rebuilding the ancient ruins is honoring the Sabbath. Because that's what comes next. That's what he says next. Some of you are going to rebuild the ancient ruins, raise up the age-old foundations, be called a repairer of the breach, restore the streets, for dwelling. So if we're going to restore, then we need to learn to restore. It says a couple of different things about the Sabbath. First of all, it's an if-then promise, okay? There's, if you do this, then I will do this, right? You know, I taught parenting classes for a long time. If you eat your vegetables, then you get the piece of pie, right? And God works with us the same way. If you will do what I've told you, if you will follow my commandments, then I will bless you. So we're going to look at what he says we're supposed to do and not do on the Sabbath in this passage. It says, if you turn back your foot from Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, turn back your foot. It's kind of a phrase that says, if you will honor the boundary, if you will honor the boundary, 
of my Sabbath. Turn back from the edge. Don't fall off. You know, I, I come from Arizona, and there's a beautiful, beautiful canyon in Arizona. It's called the Grand Canyon. And there's edges to the Grand Canyon, right? That, and it's a pretty steep drop in there. And people want to get right to the edge. They do. They, I, I don't. Every year, somebody falls in the canyon. Every year. Every year. So they have done these things to protect people, right? They've put up little fences at the edges. Well, and they've brought them farther and farther back from the edges as people go, oh, I'll just step over this because I want a better picture. That's kind of what the rabbis have done with Sabbath. God says, turn back your foot from violating this day. Don't violate this day. Turn back your foot so they put fences up, kind of, you know. Don't step over this, because if you step over this, you might fall off. So if we will honor the restrictions of the Sabbath, now I'm not going to tell you to honor all those 39 prohibition things, but I'm telling you we need to start asking the Lord, what is it you want us to do and not do on your day? And at the very least, we need to look at what the plain scripture says, where it's very definitely specifically commanded, because there are some very specific commandments that he gave us turn back from doing your pleasure on my holy day so in other words it's not about me it's not what i enjoy it's not because i like it i'm going to do this because i enjoy this and it helps me relax i've heard how many i've said that i have said that I have believed that, but he says here, honor my restrictions. It's not about what you like and don't like. <clears throat> oh, well, this kind of changes some things for me. Okay, I'll be blunt. It's going to change some things for me if I honor all of this, right? And it should change some things for all of us to be obedient to the word of God. I'm doing your pleasure on my holy day. It's his day. It's not my day of rest. It's his day. Call Sabbath a delight. The holy day of Adonai honorable. So we're supposed to call it a delight. We're supposed to call it honorable. It's not about what you cannot, can and cannot do. Now, the word delight, and this is where I'm looking for my notes because it's like, uh... The word delight means is, is also the word kavod. Kavod? Where else have we heard kavod? <laughs> We've heard kavod before, right? Heavy. The kavod is one of the things that describes the presence of God. Call my Sabbath a delight. This is my presence. This is my presence. The delight. No, wait a minute. I got that backwards. Sorry. That's the next word. Delight is the word oneg. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. The next word, the honorable, where it says the holy day of Adam, my honorable, that's kavod. That's kavod. That's the heavy presence of God. Calling it a delight, the pleasure, the delight, that's oneg. Now, how many of you know what an oneg is in a messianic congregation? An oneg is what? A fellowship meal, right? It's supposed to be delicacies. It's supposed to be a pleasurable, wonderful, delightful meal. I wonder if those notes are in here. Oh, well. It's a delightful meal. The own egg is supposed to be something enjoyed. But it says we're not supposed to cook on the Sabbath. So guess where the own egg actually is? Friday evening, as Sabbath begins. As Sabbath begins. That's why you get to prepare. That's why it's a preparation day. The cooking, all that stuff is done. And then you usher in Shabbat with an oneg, a delight. Delicacies, sweet, delicious. Honorable kavod. The heavy presence of God, the honor of God. Call my day a delight. 
a holy day of Adonai, honorable. Who remembers what holy is? Kadosh. So we call the day a delight. It's an oneg. It's a party. We call it Kadosh, separate, holy. It's separated for God. We call it honorable, kavod, the heavy presence of God. If you will honor it, not going your own ways, in other words, it's not about what I like and what I do, nor seeking your own pleasure, it's not about what I like, what I do, what I want to do, nor speaking your usual speech. And I looked that up, and basically what that means is it's not supposed to be a day where you just talk about anything you want. Your conversation is supposed to center around God. It's not a casual conversation day. You're not supposed to use, you're not supposed to tell dirty jokes. <laughs> you shouldn't anyway, but... <laughs> But at the same time, that's what it's talking about. It says, don't just involve your usual speech. And that word speech is debar, or words, just like God gave his words. So we don't go our own way. We don't seek our pleasure. We speak God's words. We do what he wants. Then it says, then you will delight, oneg, <laughs> yourself in Adonai. Okay, how many of us have reached places where in our spiritual life we're not all that excited about God? You know, there's, there's times and places we all do. He says, do you want to delight yourself in me? Then start obeying me. <laughs> do what I've said. Because if you will, then you will find the delight in me that you are looking for. So he promises delight in him if we will honor his day. And then it says, I will let you ride over the heights of the earth. This is another promise. The second promise, ride upon the high places of the earth. It's an idiom, actually. You know what an idiom is, right? It's like a saying. It's a specific saying that means something. And this idiom, this riding on the high places, well, it means to be blessed financially, with supplies, with enjoyment, with health, and help from God. Do we want to ride the high places with God? Do we want to have his financial blessing, his blessing of our health, his blessing over everything? There's condition to it. Honor my day. Call it a delight. Then it says, I will feed you with the heritage of your father, Jacob, Yaakov. What's the heritage of Jacob? The spiritual blessings that he inherited from Abraham, right? The spiritual blessings. Not only that, but God told Jacob this promise, in you will all the nations be blessed. Genesis 28, 14. He told that to Jacob. Do we want to bless the whole earth? All the nations to be blessed. Do we want to be a blessing to others? Honor and Shabbat. If then promises of God. I think losing that page can't be short. Be happy. <laughs> and then the question comes down, okay, so there's a lot of stuff we can't do. So what are we supposed to do? And what are we allowed to do? And what about what Jesus did, right? Because a lot of people will go to this passage that we read today in Matthew and say, well, look, Jesus, they violated the Sabbath. Matthew 12, verse 1, at that time, Yeshua went through the grain fields. It was on the Sabbath. They were walking. They were going somewhere. And his disciples were hungry. They began to pluck heads of grain and eat them. So basically, they're harvesting. They're... Um, what? Shucking? Yeah, they're shucking the grain and they're eating it, okay? And the Pharisees saw it and said, hey, your disciples are doing what's not allowed on the Sabbath, right? He said, haven't you read about what David did when he became hungry and those with him? How he entered into the house of God and they ate the showbread, which was not permitted for him to eat, nor those with him, but only for the Kohanim. 
So he's giving an example, by the way, he's not the only one that used this example, he's not the only one that argued this way. Hillel, who came before him, also argued this. If you are hungry, eat. If that means you have to pick an apple off the tree, eat it. But don't harvest the field. Don't harvest the tree. You're not plucking a bushel, you're getting what you need for now, period. End of discussion. David and his men were hungry coming back from battle. They stopped in the they stopped at the tabernacle, and the priest fed them from the showbread, which was for the priests only. They were hungry. Basically, what it says is we are to alleviate suffering on Shabbat. That's where he talks about being Sabbath was made. For man, not man for the Sabbath, okay? Alleviate human suffering. If there is suffering and you can make it better, make it better. If you can plan ahead for your meal, that's even better. Okay? But if someone comes to your house and they're hungry, and that means you have to cook something, alleviate suffering. That's okay on the Sabbath. In fact, that's what Yeshua teaches. We alleviate suffering on the Sabbath. Then he says, the priests in the temple. Haven't you read in the Torah that on Shabbat, the Kohanim in the temple break Sabbath, yet are innocent? Remember, one of those 12 things is the slaughter, right? What do you do for a sacrifice? The daily sacrifice is a slaughter, it's a slaughter of an animal. Not only do they do a daily sacrifice, but on Shabbat, there's an extra sacrifice. Sometimes though, I think a lot of us want to be priests and doing priests things and, and we're just making an excuse because we didn't plan ahead very well. Honestly, I'm guilty, okay, I'm guilty. Um, but what, the, what were the priests doing in the temple? What were the offerings about? But they were the work of redemption, bringing redemption to the people the sacrifices, the care of the lamp to make sure it stayed lit, acts of redemption. So on the Sabbath, Yeshua taught that it was okay and it was good to alleviate human suffering. He taught that it was okay and it was good to follow acts of redemption. What does it take to bring redemption to somebody? What does it take to help them? He says, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the innocent. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Leaving from there, he went into their synagogue. A man with a withered hand was there, so they might accuse him. They questioned Yeshua, saying, is it permitted to heal on the Sabbath? What about healing? That's something different. That's not just alleviating suffering necessarily. That's not filling empty bellies. And he said to them, What man among you will not grab his sheep and lift it out if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath? You know, if something has fallen into a pit, if somebody is hurting, if something is hurting, how much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is permitted to do good on the Sabbath, and he said to the man, stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and it was restored as healthy as the others. So we have alleviation of human suffering or hunger. We have work of redemption. That's what the priests did. We have acts of mercy, acts of mercy. It is not merciful to leave a sheep stuck in a pit, right? Or a donkey in the ditch or a person in the gutter, okay? If you see a need on the Sabbath, we are to meet that need, and we can meet that need, and we should meet that need. We should meet that need. There's a lot about the Sabbath I don't understand yet. There's a lot about how it applies that I'm not sure about. But I know there's some things in the scripture that are very specific. And I know that there's some of these things that I do on a I've done on a regular basis. But honestly, 
I want those promises that we read about, right? I really do. I want the promises. I want the blessings of life. I want enjoyment. I want the heritage of Jacob. That's my desire. I want to delight in the Lord. I want my walk with him to be a delight. And if that's the case, then maybe I need to re-examine how I do Sabbath. It's not just about coming together and worshiping on this day. It's more than that. It's about more than that. It's not just another, quote, church day. And it's not about continuing to do church as normal. It's learning what does he want and doing what he wants. And the other song I had in my mind that I wanted to do, and we're going to sing, and then I'll have Joy come and we'll do the blessing, is Trust and Obey, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah. If we want his blessing, we're just going to do the first verse in the chorus. Um, Sabbath Streams Messianic Fellowship meets every Sabbath at 3318 Maryland Avenue in Klamath Falls, Oregon. We gladly welcome all those interested in learning about the roots of our faith. If you would like to join us and need directions, please call us at 541-884-8307 or send us an email at ministry at sabbathstreams.org. Our mailing address is Sabbath Streams Ministries, P.O. Box 1938, Klamath Falls, Oregon 97601. You may also visit us at www.sabbathstreams.org.